Yes, and NyQuil was involved in that. See, what had happened was... What had happened was... Barney woke me up because he needed to go to the bathroom. So he pressed his cold nose into my arm or side or back or something, which immediately woke me up. And he said, Dad, I have to go to the bathroom. He said it just like that. He's very polite. He said, Dad, I have to go to the bathroom, please. And I said, all right, son, that's fine. So we went to the bathroom. He went to the bathroom. I didn't go to the bathroom outside. Not this time. And we came back in and I took some more NyQuil and then I slept for seven more hours. Anyway. That's like a full night's sleep twice over. Literally twice in a row, back to back. It was a double header for sleep. Oh, man. So I'm basically a zombie. And here we are. What are you drinking? Is that water? Uh, no. It's straight neck, Will. No, it's not. Um, it would be much more blue. It's a 7-Up uh, with a splash of, what is it? Crystal light? Uh, just like a few powderings of raspberry lemonade. It's like your own little board juice. I just learned what board juice was literally was it today. From, was it from the food theory video? It was. Thank you, Matt Pat. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. He did a really good job. Like, first off, board juice sound. I mean, once they started talking about Four Loco, so I went to uh, Central Washington University that is over in Ellensburg, Washington, literally in the exact geographic middle of the state. And uh, Four Locos were banned in Ellensburg because a bunch of students or a couple students died from alcohol poisoning from drinking Four Locos. So watching the board juice video, I'm like, Oh, Lord. I mean, I didn't know them personally, and they died, I think, before I got there, like a year, only a year. And they were like freshmen, so they weren't legal age. Anyway, please drink responsibly. If you're going to go wild, please don't die because you had pork juice and you drank over a gram of caffeine. Or something. I did like how in that video he pointed out like, hey, that you're taking in over a thousand milligrams of caffeine. That's not good if you're making this to recipe standards. But he also pointed out like, you can make this your own. You could make this non-alcoholic. You I could just really liked that. You could just this is your jug. You could use a half gallon. You could basically do different like he he was like you can it, he, what is he he phrased it at the end of the episode it's the best worst idea you probably have yeah honestly it has a lot of really really good upsides a lot of really bad downsides yeah don't but drink like, a fifth of vodka kiddos yeah i don't know why people would think that's a good well i know why people think that's a good idea because it's blackout rage juice <laughs> uh it's such a but, great name but taking out the social pressure of drinking, I think, is really smart because a lot of people aren't actually comfortable with getting plastered. They don't they don't enjoy it. It's not for them. There are some people who are like, this is what I live for. This is the only thing I ever want to do. And those people are alcoholics. Sorry if this is your wake-up call, but that is basically the definition of alcoholism is like being stoked to blackout. Can't wait till I can forget. <laughs> We are not here to talk about board juice, at least not this episode. I don't know. Not this episode. I don't think people call it board juice. Is it just Borg or is it Borg juice? I guess Borg juice, Borg juice is technically redundant. Yeah. That's like saying ASAP is possible. I don't. That's, I hate that's that. That's from the office. Don't worry. Oh, okay. Here's something that'll grind people's gears. I don't really like the office. I think it's I can't imagine why the type of humor that's in the office that is meant to like make people feel uncomfortable and just laugh. And it's really like, it really pushes the boundaries of what keeps the skin on my bones as far as level of comfort. It drives me nuts. Michael, anything with Dwight and Jim is the most hilarious content I've ever seen. Anytime Michael Scott opens his mouth, I want to punch him in the face just so boop, and push that's a fair just, reaction i just want to i just want to hit him just a little bit i just i just want to talk to him i just want to talk to him i just want to talk <laughs> pulls out a shotgun i just want to talk to him i just want to talk to him 
this will be one of my props for when we talk about our hobbies. Anyway, we should probably get into the episode. <laughs> Welcome to Talk About Tatooine. I'm Andrew. I'm Nathan. And we are Turin Brothers, here to bring you what's new in nerddom and give colorful commentary on our favorite subjects. Welcome to our cantina. Grab a drink and settle in as we set course for realities beyond our own. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. First of all, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you guys are watching this on YouTube. And make sure to follow the pod- podcast if you're watching on Anchor, Spotify, and now officially Apple Podcasts. We finally figured out that hurdle. We got it done. Today, we're going to be discussing Season 2, Episode 9 of The Bad Batch, The Crossing. But first, let's get into some of our starter questions. Also, make sure you guys stick around towards the end. We have a lot of fun pieces of Warhammer news. Some new models came out, and we're excited to talk about them. Yoo-hoo. let's go what have you been watching recently or reading i have been doing both actually so let me start with my my reading so i'm going to go out of order on my bullet points here so i do apologize but i wow. so literally just before while i was cooking dinner before this podcast i finished book either five it's book number six of x the x-wing series of solo command and it's dank so you get to see a ton of Han Solo. You get to see like Wet Wedge Antilles is a fantastic commander. He just has like the best written dialogue. Mm-hmm. And you get who you get to really I'm surprised how much this series dived into Wraith Squadron specifically. Yeah. Because at first I was like, oh, this is the X Wing X Wing Rogue Squadron series. And it's like, it's actually not the Rogue Squadron series. It's just X Wing. So it covers mm-hmm. Rogue Squadron and Wraith Squadron. And they're super cool. And there's just a ton of espionage and assassination and dogfights. And the dialogue is just so good. I'm absolutely loving it. I literally just finished Solo Command before coming up here. So I was like, oh, that's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and really just loving all of the sci-fi that they're putting into that. They're really getting creative with it. Now, what I've been watching has been a little rough because um, <laughs> I may have watched the season finale of The Last of Us, not realizing it was the season finale. And then... On Monday, yesterday, I opened up my tablet and got into HBO and discovered there's no new episode of The Last of Us. And I wanted to punch a hole through a wall (laughs) because I didn't realize it was it. And I was like, wow, these are they're sure really causing some damage here. This this is going to be hard to wrap up (laughs) in the next episode. That's my brain during the entire thing. And it was the season finale. And I didn't realize it. So now I have to go back and watch it again with a different mindset. Because when you watch something knowing it's a season finale, you're anticipating certain things happening. And it's I different. Didn't, it just hits different. And I feel like I kind of ruined it for myself. But that being said, um, really loved it. Absolute banger. Um, I have been torn asunder by my own mistake. But I'm very, very excited to rewatch that. Um, it's going to be on my rewatch list. I will probably watch through The Last of Us every single year. It is, it is that good. I mean, it's, it's some of the best television that's come out. I think one of the only things I didn't like about it is that, like Ellie, especially, has a she's just got a, a potty mouth. But that's actually really key to the story. I usually think excessive language is a filler for bad writing. Uh, in this case, it actually symbolizes ellie's loss of childhood because she's using adult language because she's putting getting put through adult situations but she's a child and her language is actually like it it, to me personally it made me mourn because of the loss of her childhood Mm -hmm. i actually had a very similar note to you under this section I, i all i put was there is a the last of us shaped hole in my heart 100% it was so good so traumatizing but so good <laughs> also i am rereading the thron books i just finished thron alliance uh thron allegiances on my drive home today and it's really good one of the things we rediscover and reintroduce into canon is the material cart cortosis uh, it was reintroduced back in the canon, obviously in this book, back when it came out in 2018. But this material actually first showed up in Star Wars in the Old Republic in a book called Path of Destruction back in 2006. It was wrote, written by Drew Carpishan. It's one of the first books in the Darth. It is the first book in the Darth Bane trilogy. It's what one of my favorites. I, I reread it probably every year. It's so good. 
Um, I read it when I was a teenager and I thought this is the coolest thing I've ever read. It has like this magnificent display of dark side force power in it just all the way through. It's, it's such an awesome story. I can't recommend it enough. If we do a book club on this podcast, we should start there. That would be awesome. They're such good books. I have actually, um, above me on the top of my shelf, I have, uh, several Republic Commando novels, the trilogy, the Dark Darth Bane trilogy, two of the Chuck Wendig novels from post episode seven, and then I have the Inheritance series. All up there. I also would really like to do a couple dozen episodes on the Inheritance series. What games have you been playing? I just started up a new Minecraft world and I love it so much. Minecraft Minecraft is on the short list of games that I consider my old reliables, meaning anytime I play it, I get joy. It sparks joy. And I really like Minecraft specifically because I can listen to books while I play. That is probably the biggest joy that I get out of it. Is being able to read through being able to listen to my audiobooks while that happens. And so that's how I I try to read or read and or listen to a hundred books a year. And that's honestly part of how I get it done. So I've also been trying to finish the Halo Infinite campaign. One of our very first episodes, we grilled Halo Infinite. And I actually just recently got an Xbox Series X. For whatever reason, there's an audio glitch on my computer where I can't get this insane buzzing out of my headset when I play Halo Infinite. Uh, it's usually the kind of buzzing you would get if you have audio enhancements turned on for a headset. You have to like go into your audio control panel, go to properties and turn it off. Well, when I do that, it doesn't change it. It works for literally everything else and it's only that game. And I didn't finish it because of that. It, there was like an update, ruined it for me. But now I'm back. Some light spoilers, just a little mini review on where I'm at in the campaign. So the weapon, the AI that is with Master Chief turns out to be a copy of Cortana. And my response was, yeah, no doy. <laughs> she sounds like Cortana. She looks like Cortana. She's an AI. It's just Cort Cortana sans rampancy. I didn't realize that was supposed to be a reveal. Like, I thought that was just obvious. Like, was this supposed to be a twist? Seriously. Was it supposed to be a twist because it was so obvious i thought it was just assumed the entire campaign i was wondering is this actually cortana because it seems like cortana and then the surprise twist was yeah this lady who looks nearly identical to cortana and has the same voice as her is just a copy of cortana zero out of ten for the writing of halo infinite the story of halo has unfortunately gone down the tubes which is really unfortunate because of some of the older Halo books and the original Halo games. Fascinating. Some of the coolest lore mm -hmm. ever. Some arguably. of the coolest lore ever. Anytime you have religious zealotry in space on a galactic scale, you're going to have a good time. Pretty much. Looking at you, Warhammer. I have been kind of getting back into my main rotation when I actually can play games. I have been playing a lot of Marvel Snap. I actually streamed several hours of that today. That was really fun. That was awesome. And I got like, not to brag, but I got like nine views. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually kind of hoping that blows up a little bit just because I, I've, I'm i still relatively new to streaming to YouTube. And mm -hmm. that's been kind of a hard switch because I've gone from like actually making a little bit of money on Twitch to streaming over on YouTube. And it's like basically starting over but right. with a lot less functionality. And so I'm trying to figure out whether or not this is worth it for me to stay over there. So I haven't figured that out yet, but I did do a big Marvel, straps, Marvel Snap stream today. I am doing a Call of Duty series. So I am working on a what I call the Research and Development series for Call of Duty. And that is basically me just going through and using different weapons and actually doing 
kind of a st really basic statistical comparison for different weapons and how they perform in matches of currently 10v10. And I would like to get much bigger I sample sizes because the meme of your sample size is small and your standard deviation sucks immediately pops to mind. And I would like to get more data points for that. But honestly, like I played... I'm trying to think. I played five games for four different SMGs, plus I played two extra because I needed to redo some rounds because the numbers weren't right. So I had to invalidate those data points, essentially. And that took me like over two hours to do. And I was like, oh, crap, this is going to take a while. But it's also really fun because it's it's just fun. I've also been streaming my Minecraft world. So I'm basically streaming Marvel Snap, Call of Duty, and Minecraft all right now. And then mm -hmm. when I want to play something that's not a streaming game, I usually hop into Minecraft, or not Minecraft, StarCraft co-op and do some of that. So yeah. uh, I'm just kind of happy to be back into that and trying to get back into doing consistent content creation. It's really hard. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And I see a lot of the work that you put into it and... Uh, our Instagram oddly like blew up this week. So that was awesome. Yeah, we have a new most popular video. If you're looking at just uh, views, mm -hmm. which I was super excited about, that's on my TIE Fighter project that I wrote up and basically recorded and found footage for and did all the editing for. I was really happy because it actually totally flopped on other platforms. And I was really sad. And it was. They were really high quality shorts that you put out that were just little lore bits, little like donut holes of lore. Donut and holes of lore. Equally tasty that. to the rest of the donut, but somehow disregarded as inferior. They were really good, is what I'm trying to say. And people are missing out. And maybe they'll still blow up. You never know. Yeah, sometimes they just take a little bit. So I've been really excited about that. And weirdly enough, when we made our and or predictions, we basically released a short that said, hey, here are the theories we got wrong. And weirdly enough, people loved that. That video got over 500 likes. I've never got 500 likes on a single post of any platform of any content ever. So I was super excited about that. And it got over 5,000 views, almost 6,000. We broke the 6,000 mark yesterday on this newer video. And weirdly enough, this one has generated way more follows, which I've been really yes. interested about. Like people have just been following like crazy because people like lore. And coming mm -hmm. up, we have, I have written out, recorded, but not edited yet, footage for the TIE Interceptor, the TIE Defender, and the TIE Bomber. I have all three of those. I just need to go through and actually make that material and then put basically footage or uh, using stock photos on top of it. So very exciting. exciting. Yeah. And moving forward, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more of that. Those seem to really kill and we both really enjoy doing the research for those. And it's been a lot of fun. I'm currently writing a series of, I'm calling them First Legion debriefs. It's first person accounts of stormtroopers who have served nearby Lord Vader and telling accounts of different battles and things from the stormtroopers' perspective. So I love that. I'm excited. I'm excited about that. Hopefully, hopefully it turns out. Yeah, I think you're going to have a heck of a time. Well, because some of the battles are from the books. So you might have a heck of a time getting footage but that's what that's pictures fine. are for so mm -hmm. fancy slideshow what hobby work have you gotten in done we, that was a bad phrasing <laughs> what hobby work have you completed i have actually gotten a ton done so we have the reason we are the prime reason we are recording this on a tuesday night is because saturday our normal recording days we're going to be doing a 2v2 warhammer game and it's yeah. going to be absolutely dope so mm -hmm. i have been trying to bust butt trying to get this done and i have come to a couple of conclusions which now present nathan now looks back at past nathan and shakes his head in dismay and just huge disappointment because past nathan is such an idiot First of all, I have a few different models now that essentially are painted, painted with contrast paints. Yay. And this is so much higher quality. So you, this is literally one coat of paint. It's really good. So you can see all the detail. It's really good. And he's got a little bit of purple helmet and it's very, very light. So like I went over this really, really lightly. I do need to get a black contrast paint for the weapon because I did this with my black regular paint and it just it hides too much of the detail and that's why contrast paint paints are honestly amazing because i can just go over these really quick and they're battle ready so super I have excited a black you can about borrow. that 
Also, I have raved about this a lot, but I made a really cool find. So I know you won't be able to see this, but Hoplite Game Studios makes these bases that you can buy in packs. And I'm really excited about it because it has the magnet place for it already. That's what that little shiny thing is. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had these for all of my models because the magnet fits in perfect. I can essentially magnetize this to anything I want. So like, for example, my little like watering can, I can now tip this guy upside down and get all his nooks and crannies and he's not going anywhere. So that I, I'm just like looking back and I'm like, why did I not do all of these things? And one of the things that's making this shine and like really get all of that, like really good detail to pop white base coat, white primer base coat. And I wish I would have done that with all my models because yeah, I used a, I used the Citadel Mechanicus gray at first. Cause I was like, Oh, I kind of like this color. Let's do it over all of my other models. So you have to use really vibrant, and like thick paints. Whereas now I have a white paint and this is literally just like store-bought, like white plastic primer, like super, yeah. it's an all purpose primer. So it costs a third of the price of Citadel. And yeah, now dude, my models, Citadel and now paints. my models look better. And I'm like, what the heck, man, dude. And, yeah. this, and this took me a fraction of the time in the hand cramps to get looking way better than most of my other models. Dude, and that's the thing. That's really important for those of you who are getting into the hobby or got into it over COVID or something is don't be afraid to restart. I, <laughs> the first models I painted looked like a toddler had gotten a hold of them. They are like, they were gross. Like I could, it was like, I forgot how to paint between the lines. I didn't water down my paints, even though. I had watched like a billion videos on YouTube and everyone was like, water down your paints. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't water down my paints. And I basically uh, had a couple of salt intercessors that were scrap. They were just straight scrap because I tried to strip the paint off of them. Also don't use paint stripper. It's what's it called? Um, turpentine. Turpentine. It melts plastic too. I loved so, that short that you posted because that's actually one of the ones you post on your panic channel. And there's like yes. one person, the Warhammer community is so good spirited. There was like one person who was like, you're an idiot. I can't believe you put that in turpentine. And then everyone else was like, it's okay. He's one with Nurgle now. It's fine. Yeah. Everyone was like, like, I love you guys. guys. Everyone without even prompting. Everyone was like, this is a Nurgle joke now because he was disfigured. Also, I am putting a dark purple um, and it, I, I actually didn't like how this turned out, but here's one of my mega knobs. And basically I painted this and I was like, yay, guys, work in progress. I got some paint down on my mega knobs. And everyone that commented was like, why did you post a picture of a base? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yep, there it is. I was like, it was just person after person, it. person after person was like, why is there only an orc head or why is it just a base? Like you didn't post anything here. And it, like for a second, I was like, you guys are dumb. And then I realized, oh, it's because purple sneaky and you can't see it because it's orc. They believe you can't be seen. So you can't be seen. No, sir. You are dumb. It's yes. Fine. So it's one of my favorites. I mean, you... Again, you literally watched how long it took me to be like, what the heck is he talking about? He's and like, insane. the thing is, it took me that long to figure it out. And that was not the first time you told me that joke in the last two days. So even then my brain was like, uh, just like <laughs> the Patrick meme where his brain is literally smirking. <laughs> yep. hundred percent. Real quick. I'm going to show you what I'm working on. Oh, I yeesh. call these, I call these my forbidden popsicles. Because I am prepping my weapons to paint. So the one I just put down was Thunder Hammers. And this one is just a smattering of lightning claws. This is so I can prime them all at the same time. And then I'm going to take my airbrush and paint them all silver. And then I'll go back and do the magnets and the details later. I'm mostly just trying to get them tabletop ready. I'm scrambling. I had an entire week off last week, and because I was sick, I didn't get anything done. It was actually, it really sucked. I was, I'm still kind of 
pissed off about it. To, to, I basically lost a whole week. I didn't get any hobby work done. I didn't do anything productive whatsoever. I could, I was barely conscious enough to play video games. Like, is the bad kind of sick? Yeah, that's but, no fun. But I'm trying to get them ready because I'm running 1,500 points of Deathwing, and I'm going all melee Terminators. So I kind of hope you're on my team. We'll see. We'll see. We haven't decided teams we'll yet. See. It's just going to be random when we get there. All right. Let's get moving. Hit us with that spoiler warning. You got it. So before we get into any of our episode reviews, you guys know that our policy is is that we review the episodes several weeks post-release. Gives you guys plenty of time to watch them. But consider this your official spoiler warning for Season 2, Episode 9, The Crossing of the Bad Batch. If you haven't clicked off by this point, I am talking plenty long enough for you to get out. You've been warned. Go ahead and hit us with your rating. One out of ten. Goodbye. Goodbye. Did I write down a rating? I did. No, you did not. I was thinking earlier today. I was like, "Yeah, I filled out everything. It's fine. We're ready to go." I'm so stupid. Okay. On subject, I try not to say anything when I'm watching new content because I think it's rude to the people I'm watching with. I don't want to color their opinion or their experience of anything. Uh, anytime I'm in a movie theater and I I see people on their phones or talking or doing something, I just want to uh, throw whatever hard candy I have at them at the back of their head as hard as I can. And yes, I realize that's assault, but it's a dark movie theater and my probability of being caught is low, but I still, I digress. I'm going to give it a five out of 10. And I think that's still pretty generous considering this episode had a lot of sawdust in it a lot of of filler a lot of sawdust you know i did fill it out because oh i wrote it down later i said this episode has a lot of filler yeah that's why i thought i had everything yeah i just didn't like it i don't really i've never enjoyed their side quests especially when sid is involved she is a scummy piece of garbage and i hope a very terrible fate befalls her Yeah, she's kind of the worst. My rating out of 10 was actually a 4 out of 10, so I actually rated it a little bit lower. I had to actually look back at our our review of the episode faster because I thought this was almost as bad, and so I wanted to make sure the numbers lined up because I gave that a 3 out of a 10, and I said this was 4 out of 10 because this was okay. But this is okay. It was better than faster. So here's the thing. It's okay like in the sense of if you ask a spouse or like a your dating partner like hey are you okay and they're like i'm fine that's the level of okay like if i were like it's fine Sus. like and i'm like mm, i don't believe you it's that i'm fine but actually like i'm gonna murder you in your sleep you better sleep with one eye open kind of fine um because it wasn't good um it basically goes over just like some like some decent character development but they took way too long and it was very heavy-handed I think the only good thing that came out of this episode was basically the group is distancing themselves from Sid. They're like, hey, we got stranded on a planet on a job that you sent us. And you basically were like, that's not my problem. She almost verbatim said that. Wasn't super excited about that. And overall, I just think this episode could have been much more than just the like Omega tech conflict in this episode. Again, Mm -hmm. I felt like that was very heavy handed. Like tech actually doesn't talk that much. And when he started talking in this episode, it was very belligerent. Like he was being super rude and they don't even like, yeah, they don't even suss out like, Oh, did he admit like, Oh, I was rude because like, I miss, I miss echo too. He didn't say that. He was just like, my bad. And I'm like, "Mm, come on. Like, show some more finesse, guys. Like, yeah, he's supposed to be the kind of, like, socially awkward one and, like, is better at talking to computers than he is to humans. Like, we get it. Like, he's basically the engineer of the group. I know. I was going to say, I have a lot of engineer coworkers who are much more personal (laughs) than tech. And I don't know. For me, it just felt very heavy handed. Like, yay, they got some they got some character development points. Awesome. And other than that, I was like, yep, four out of ten. I will rewatch this because I like rewatching Star Wars content, especially when I'm painting. But if I was paying enough attention, I would probably skip this episode. Favorite moments from this episode. My favorite ep- part of this episode was actually when they were mining the Ipsium. I thought that mm. was really 
cool for them to basically continue to add kind of the sci into sci-fi, like the science aspect. Mm -hmm. So similarly to, you were talking about cortosis, like when they're talking about material sciences in Star Wars, I love that stuff. Like the Mandalorian has a huge focus on like what Beskar is and like, it's really significant to that culture. And they get into like some of the material sciences and like only the armorer has like the forge equipment necessary to work Beskar. And it's very Mm. important. I just love it when they do stuff like that. I would love it if they talked even more about like the general things that they use, like, Hey, talk about Plascrete more, talk about Dura, uh, duracrete or duraplast or whatever they you know use Dura like steel dura steel thank you or transparent yeah. steel like hey like talk about how your windows are are they steel are they glass you call them transparent steel but they shatter mm-hmm. like glass so like what's up with that um but i i just really like when they talk more about this stuff i i think star wars does a really good job of talking about new elements and metals and specifically the mandalorian does a really good job at introducing creatures from the Mm -hmm. star wars universe they have a lot of animals and i would hope that we can see the bad batch do the same i love it when they dig into stuff like that i really like that and i want to just give a shout out to the bad batch animators the actual animation of mining the ipsium they probably spent an incredible amount of time doing that it looks so real like to to watch a slow-mo shot of the drill actually eat its way through the dirt, that's a lot of particles to to model and to animate. So I I just really liked that little scene. I was like, that's awesome. I really it was like oddly that. satisfying. Absolutely. Maybe we could just take a footage of that and just have that on loop and just have it as an oddly satisfying. We thought of it first. Just them mining Ipsium. I had no theories from this. I basically thought this episode was a dead end. Um, I don't even think that Omega's interactions with tech will even go anywhere. I don't think anything is going to come of that. I think it's just we see that they don't exactly get along. You know, okay, Omega has her favorites. She kind of gets along with Echo. I mean, Echo's kind of brusque, too. He kind of says some things that are like... He's like, they're true, but it's like, he's still a little harsh. Whether as Hunter and Wrecker are really the ones she bonds with. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yeah, that being said, I don't really have any theories. I thought this episode was, is a one-off. There's a side quest. Who cares? Pretty much. I kind of, uh, the reason I didn't write any theories down for this was I kind of just posed in the questions, like, are we too far ahead at this point to make theories? Because I feel like we're, we're all caught up. And there's Mm -hmm. like 12, 13 episodes or something like that out by this time. So we're well far ahead of where these are at. So I I, I don't know. I don't like giving theories when I'm like, well, technically I know what happens next. So I'm like, I'm not going to make theories about that. I'm still kind of sticking with our theories that we made at the beginning of the season. Um, Mm -hmm. But we haven't seen too much progress on that yet that we will talk about in this episode. So go ahead. In our next episode, let's revisit those theories and just like, let people know be like this is how we're doing so far do we need to change anything that might be a good way to to approach that absolutely hit us with some lore from this episode so we've talked a lot about ipsium and different materials from star wars but like i said in this one we're specifically going to talk about ipsium for just a little bit ipsium was first seen in this episode this was actually ipsium's debut into the star wars galaxy we had never heard of this material before in star wars These two episodes of Bad Batch, so this one and the next one, are the only references to this material on Wikipedia. It had never existed before. This element of world building, lol, can be a double-edged sword, though. Establishing materials, items, locations, etc. as narrative elements can be a very effective way of drawing in your audience, right? Your brain doesn't take into account that these materials aren't real. What it does is you just assume that it is real and you start thinking out the logical ramifications of this item being introduced into the story. And the more powerful the item, the more impact that these different like space minerals have on this story. And the Mandalorian does it perfectly with Beskar. Like it is, it's like a main staple 
of the story is Beskar. And you see the Mandalorian himself. He has a suit of pure Beskar armor. We don't even see a lot of the other more devout Mandalorians with such a pure suit of Beskar armor. And with it, he's able to literally fight off a lightsaber with his fists. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Conversely, while exploring the galaxy, it can turn into uh, sort of a like those childhood instances on the playground of just like the superseding power creep. Let me explain that a little bit. You have two children on a, on a playground and they're in this like imaginal imaginary battle and both children have force powers. Child A goes, I use force push. And child B goes, well, I cast force shield. And then child A goes, well, my force push turns into lightning and breaks your shield. And then child B goes, my shield is lightning resistance. You see what I'm going on? It just goes on and on. And it's just an arbitrary game of one-upsmanship until the one child runs out of things to think of and grabs their lightsabers and go home. Not based on a specific example of real life just throwing that out there but do you see what i'm saying if star wars introduces too many of these magical mystical kind of overpowered elements and materials it makes the other ones less cool if there were like a hundred other alloys or materials like beskar beskar would not be as special you know what i'm saying it dilutes the it dilutes the pool i guess it's really what i'm trying to say so we may see ipsium in the future uh i don't think we will i could be wrong this could be a Chekhov's gun kind of thing where everything that comes into the story has a specific place in the story i don't know that this is that because i like they lose all their ipsium like it blows up <laughs> and they nearly die um so I I don't think it's going to be that big a deal. I mean, it sort of comes into play in the next episode, but as far as the overall arc and story of the Bad Batch, Ipsium is nothing. That actually transitions really well into my least favorite part of this episode. And that's actually the overall lack of detail. And I'll expand on this on a couple of different things, because me and you, being twins, we went along the same path. We both looked this mineral up. We thought, hey, this is a really cool idea. They're coming up with new minerals, new compounds, things like that. Let's see if it's mentioned somewhere else in the Star Wars universe. Both of us literally looked it up on Wikipedia, because you wrote it down, and I also looked on that today when I was doing my notes, and I was like, oh my gosh, we're twins. Anyway, this is a frustrating example of how little detail is given in every aspect of this episode. And what I mean is they give you two pieces of data about Ipsium and that is it. And they stick with those mm -hmm. two pieces of data. And that is what we know is one Ipsium is valuable when refined. That is stated multiple times. The other thing is it's explosive when raw and unrefined. Other than that, we know nothing else. You want to know what another part of this episode that's super annoying? The name yes. of the planet is unknown that they are on. No one mentions the name of the planet. It's in the Wikipedia article. I watched through that and the following episode. They do not mention the planet by name in either of this or the following episode. This show is meant to be world building. When Disney is adding new content into the Star Wars universe, it's meant to expand and enrich the universe. And when you tell me that there's a brand new element or mineral that we have no idea what it does other than it's valuable and it explodes, you're like, cool. So does like a ton of different gases, but this is not a gas. It's a liquid. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And also, what planet are you on? That gives a base of reference so that you can tell subsequent stories. If you don't give the planet yeah. name, they're like, cool. Now are they just going to make this like any planet or they're going to have to retcon that later and say, oh, by the way, they're going to have to drop name drop Ipsium and say, oh, this is found on this planet. And then it's going to have to be tangentially linked to, oh, yeah. remember that episode of Bad Batch we saw like 10 years ago that like mentioned Ipsium? Oh, yeah, this is like retconned and now it's on this planet because they never mentioned it. Like why, why not and go to the, yeah. the it, it's one word. 
just make up a name and say, hey, <laughs> on the planet Stardust, that's a stupid name for a planet because that's the first thing that came to my mind because it's Star Wars. Okay. Um, I can't think of planet names off off the top of my head. Okay. But anyways, give the name. Dungledorf. Dungledorf. Give the planet the name. You're like, hey, uh, Sid sending us on a mission to the planet Dungledorf to go look for Ixion. <laughs> Boom. You have that detail dropped in there and it's done. Boom. You don't even have to mention it. But they mention yep. it by the planet like 18 times in episode 9 and uh, in episode 10, which if you guys don't know by now, episode 10 is the following episode that plays right into the story of this one. If there's anything worse than filler, it's a two-part filler. Which is a really a bummer because I actually love two part episodes. I think they're like one of my favorites because it builds they're suspense. So good. It helps the rising yeah. action of the story, and they just like I don't know, they fumbled it. Yeah, I'm I'm almost tempted to not even review the next episode because it's not that great. I mean, that's why we review it, right? Because not all of them are winners. One thing I wanted to say as my least favorite, which I didn't write down, is why doesn't their ship have locked doors? A child or teenager. Teenager, Severity, yeah. Yeah, teenager is able to sneak onto their ship and hotwire it and leave. Did did they even show him hotwiring it? He essentially just walked in and took it. Like they, they So I I did rewatch it specifically for this detail because I'm like, why didn't they just I'm like, you don't walk away from your car without locking it. Why is it any different for their ship? Why would you ever le like let your ship out of your sight? If someone can literally just hop on board and take it. And I know that's like a thing in Star Wars. Like if you know people just hop into uh, like the cockpit of a TIE fighter and they just like race off. Poe and Finn do that at the very beginning of episode seven. That's a little different because it's not like a, it's not a personal vehicle. But like the Marauder is their home. It's their personal vehicle. It's basically an RV that can fly through space and has big cannons on it. Lock it. Like just lock it. There's no reason somebody should be able to just walk up and take it. And that's exactly what happened. It was very, it just, it really broke me out of the story. I really couldn't keep going after that. That is all I have for this episode. Again, not a great one. Uh, not every episode of season two of The Bad Batch has been a banger. The ones that are good have been great, but the ones that have not been have been really low. And I think that's really frustrating because it doesn't seem like this is going to be a 20 some odd episode season. Like we're probably close to the end of the season and what, like a quarter of this season was filler. That's not good. Indeed. If your season is 20 some odd episodes long, sure, you can have some filler. And sometimes that filler turns out to be something good. Like not every episode of Supernatural, which is... Some people don't think it's a great show. I think it's kind of good. But they have fun with the filler. If the fi if it's good filler, if it's good sawdust, you're not going to hear me complain. This was not good sawdust. All right, guys, we are done with the Bad Batch episode nine review. We're going to jump into some news from the Hollow Net. I'm going to be cool. reading off a ton of stuff because Games Workshop just announced a big Big, big update with Arcs of mm -hmm. Omen Vashtor and the Wrath of the Soul Forge King, a new book and box set for Warhammer 40,000, which will hit pre-order on March 11th, 2023, which was 10 days ago as of this recording. So <laughs> uh, that just shows you how often I... Uh, reviewed this. GW has released Wrath of the Soul Forge King box set. This set recreates the scenes from Vashtor's invasion of the rock, and in, in, it is the first time Vashtor the Archifane and Supreme Grandmaster Azrael will also be available. The set comes with a Venom Crawler, two Hulking Obliterators, and ten Chaos Cultists, ready for the battle against ten Intercessors and five Deathwing Terminators, and that is alongside Azrael as well, in his Primaris upgrades. This box also comes with two Dark Angels Primaris upgrade frames and a set of 155 Dark Angels transfers. Vashtor the Arcfane is the new demon in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, described by Games Workshop as an enigmatic demonic mechanic, a fiendish forge master who specializes in corrupt machines and insane innovation he is the king of the forge of souls very very exciting super excited to hear more about that and then we get into the numbers of all of the new box sets that they released so 
not only did they release the Wrath of the Soul Forge King box set, which will retail for two hundred and ten U.S. dollars. <sighs> The rules book Arcs of Omen Vashor will retail for another 60 as well. So if you want the rule book and the models, $270, which if you're buying it in Washington, basically sales tax is going to bring it up to 300 So yes, <laughs> big drop. So, But we did get some new boarding patrols as well. So we got some for Admech or Adeptus Mechanicus for those who are not familiar with Warhammer shorthand, Chaos Demons, Death Guard, and Gene Stealer Cult. So... Let's go over those breakdowns because we're actually going to talk about which are which sets are going to give you the most amount of points for your dollar. So let's talk about the ad mech first. Comes with the Dominus, comes with 10 stick skitari. I can't talk here, guys. The English language is failing me. It's going to give you five rust walkers, three catafrons for 140 USD. Now keep in mind, this is uh going to why did I write down? I don't know where I got the math on this one. So this is essentially going to come out to about $1.6 spent. Why did I hold on? That's 345 points. Dude. Screw one point six points per dollar. Yeah, but I think I did the math wrong. Hold on. That's not supposed to. I don't know where I came up with the with two with 140. I must have been drunk while I was writing this. Or are you? Possibly. Well, <laughs> not drunk, but potentially intoxicated. Okay, this makes Tuned more sense. This makes more sense. Two point four points per dollar okay. expense. Two point four. I was like, one point six is way too low. That was That's the wrong number. Really low. <laughs> Nathan doesn't know how to do math. All right, so Put another stupid tally for Nathan. That's another one. Absolutely. Chaos Demons is the next one. This box comes with Karanak. 10 flesh hounds and 10 blood letters. This retails for 130 US dollars but gives you 370 points. Divide 370 by $130 gives you 2.8 points per dollar spent. So a little bit better value than our Adeptus Mechanicus at the 2.4 mark. Which I'm going to put in right there. There we go. 2.4. There we go. Next, we're going to be talking about Death Guard. So Death Guard, the boarding action set, comes with a Lord of Virul Virulence, 10 Plague Marines, 3 Death Shroud Terminators. Are those Terminators? I think yes, I just wrote are. down Death Shroud because for some reason I would assume that I knew what I meant when I wrote this last. So 3 Death, Death Shroud, Shroud Terminators Term for a decent amount of points, 115 US dollars. Wow. So a lot cheaper and it's 460 points worth of models, which gives you four points per dollar spent. So really so the it's, best value so far. If you're looking at points more per dollar. Points, it's more points for fewer dollars. Correct. Absolutely. So it looks like the Death Guard is going to be the best boarding action set if you're looking at it from that metric. Then and we it's look the at, closest to 500 points, which is the limit yes. for a boarding action. Yes, absolutely. I would luck love slight side note i would love on this channel if we actually tested those box sets out and then did a performance test based on its points per model and actually see which one performs the best i would love to do that just a side note anyway then we look into gene steve support cult. our patreon <laughs> yeah, support our patreon um we're actually working on getting that set up so don't you worry guys um <laughs> the next one is gene Steeler cult um there was Part of me that was when I was looking through this, I was like, this doesn't have an HQ. Um, the, I'm super unfamiliar with the Gene Steeler cult as a faction. So it comes with a Keller morph, which I believe is an elite, not an HQ. Don't quote me on that or do comment, please. We'd love the engagement if I'm totally wrong, but also comes with 10 acolytes, five aberrants, an abominant for $125. So this comes out to 399 points, which comes out to a 3.12 points per dollar spent. So that actually puts them in third place for most amounts of points per dollar spent. Mm -hmm. GW also released a few other things as well. They released a new dice set, which boy, howdy, guess what? They're overpriced. You can buy yeah. 15 dice for $35. Oh my gosh. Holy for reference. Wow. The set of 36 dice that I buy from Chessex, which is the brand that also look cool, they're like $10 for 36. So yeah, that's putting your dice at like a soft round of like 30 cents per dice or something like that. Third, No, it's like 35 cents. 
right? Something like that. It's a lot cheaper. Don't do math on the internet, folks. And then you look <laughs> at the Games Workshop and it's over $2 per dice. That's so stupid. I wouldn't pay $2 for a dice. Like, what? Anyways, and then they also released the Typhon Heavy Siege Tank. I don't know anything about that because I didn't have time to write it. So I'll have to look that up and see if uh, I can run it in my Space Marine 40k army because that sounds like a Horus Heresy tank. That's actually my first impression as well, but I can't remember. Cool. Well, that is a lot to know. I didn't know about the Vashtor box and I kind of want to buy it. And it'd be pretty cool. Although I need to just like hold my horses because it, we're probably going to get the lion soon. Who is the Primarch for the Dark Angels? Maybe one of these days we'll do an episode on what Primarchs are and why they're important to Warhammer and blah 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 blah. blah, blah. They're super cool, and I will probably I will probably shell out for the lion on day one because I'm a simp. I sure hope so. I can't wait for you to get the lion because your army, no offense, kind of sucks. It's getting better though. With the newest point update, it's way better. <laughs> God, they suck. Uh, yeah, currently Necrons were a hard counter to my army, and I don't, like exclusively played against Necrons for a really long time. When we last went on vacation together, we played several rounds, and I think you beat me two out of three games. I thought we only played two games. We might have only played two games. I thought it was a one and one. Yeah. But like the one I came out victorious was a close game. And the other one was not. You destroyed me. Orcs like to smash stuff. Yeah. I got into melee distance of an orc army without any melee care i ran a very shooty space marine gunline army and i was summarily cut to pieces also my lights are telling me that it's bedtime so would you mind hitting our outro i would love to thanks so much for watching everybody every single one of you watching yeah i'm looking at you i'm looking at you you're amazing and we love you anyways andrew did not like that Anyways, make sure you guys leave your theories in the comments, share pictures of your models on Twitter and Instagram. We'd love to see what you guys are getting up to and shoot us an email at talkabouttatooine at gmail.com if you've got questions you want featured on air. That's actually a segment we would love to start adding in. We just need to wait on you guys. Make sure to subscribe and like this video so all the algorithmic overlords will slice this video into the feeds of other like-minded folk. Until next time, the Emperor protects and may the force be with you.